Welcome to episode 96, part 1 of Awesome Astronomy for June 2020. Well, wasn't May an interesting month? Where do we begin? To be honest, I don't really know, so I'm not going to. I'm sure you are just as fed up of hearing about all the truly atrocious things happening in the world right now as I am. So, let's shut out the terrors of the outside world and turn our thoughts to the much bigger and much more amazing universe out there for an hour or so. Despite everything, scientists and astronomers have been rocking the research lately and we've got an episode coming up that's absolutely jam-packed with brilliant discoveries made by teams of international collaborators, some of whom have probably never even seen each other, let alone be in the same country. Despite this, they managed to do something amazing and chip away at the great unknown out there, one little observation or simulation at a time. A work ethic that some politicians would do well to sit up and pay attention to. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. Time for whimsical pondering, big dreaming and happy hour at your local fridge, where there's never enough cider and too many cans of carling left over from that barbecue last year. Yeah, you know who you are. If you aren't going to drink it when you bring it, at least have the courtesy to take it away when you stagger home. <laughs> I guess it's probably still good for the slug traps anyway. I'm Jenny, your host for this month, and joining me is the ever seller Ralph. Cheers. <laughs> and the cosmic wonder that is Paul. Oh, hang on. There we go. That, that, was, my, that was my beer mug. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. So, what's been occurring? Ooh. Well, the first thing I want to mention is uh, just how wonderful amateur astronomers are. Uh, when we had to cancel the Spring Astro Camp, um, we we just threw out a suggestion that people might want to, the people that had already paid their admission, mm. might want to donate their um, their admission fee to the local businesses in, in Cumdy in Wales, um, and expecting maybe one or two to get back. Quite a surprise went over... Two thousand uh, pounds was donated, meaning the the three main businesses that uh, that we frequent when we're there—the campsite, the pub, and the cafe—we can send them all um, seven hundred and forty pounds each to to help with uh, with the, the lockdowns that they're going through there. And um, that is amazing. And uh, just yeah, just want to say, just well done to everybody yeah. that that was able to do that because everyone's going through hard times at the moment. That was just astounding. Yeah. It was that's a lot of money. Mm. It really is. It was great. It was great. And my only regret is that we didn't keep it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was I know, but the, the fees to send a wire transfer to Sidonia are too expensive, yeah, aren't they? Otherwise, just, we would have done. We'd have trousered yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. It's 10,000 grand or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 10,000 grand? That doesn't make sense. I guess we'll it, it can make sense. Yeah, I'll have that. <laughs> um, but that was great. That's a million, isn't it? 10 million. Yeah. <laughs> But it was great. It was great. They, they. It was really. We, we were really, really touched actually. Um, yeah. When, when it came in, because we, we, we discussed doing it. And we're like, oh, okay, yeah. A few people might, you know, pop their, pop their fee in, and, and you know, there'll be a couple hundred quid we can pop over and say, sorry, we're not coming. But it was great. The pot was huge. We were yeah. really, yeah. really astounded. It was brilliant. Well done, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. And if anybody's wondering um, why it is that in scientific journals and all over Wikipedia, pair instability supernovae aren't referred to as devastation overs or annihilators, um, the reason is that I've only just sent the email off to the 53 most preeminent scientists <laughs> and astronomers <laughs> in the field of, uh, of collapsing supernovae and uh, pair instability explosions. And how explosions. long did that take you? Yeah, that was that's probably a couple of months. <laughs> 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 that's why we are very, very amateurs at this. <laughs> it's all- I tell you what, though, I'd forgotten that we were sending off the emails. I'd forgotten that was a and thing. Yeah, I had, I had, and then so at least you remember. And then you copied me into the email. I was like, oh yeah, there's that thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was thinking it's just been in the back of my mind for ages, and then we've had the Astro Camp thing to do, and mm. you know we're always either editing or, um, or or scripting for this show, so that one's just slipped further and further down. You know, because <laughs> got to go to work and all that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, that just slipped further and further down the agenda, but it's finally gone off now. Not had any replies back yet. Uh, it went off a couple of days ago. Um, and, you know, I, I think a lot of academics um, aren't uh, at 100% capacity anyway at mm. universities. So uh, we'll see what happens to that. And hopefully uh, we'll have a nice uh, name that you've suggested being used for pair instability supernovae. Mm. Although I did this now. Do you know, I literally just noticed that the acronym for it is P. Because <laughs> it's taking the piss. I think somebody uh, said that in one of the emails. Yeah, someone said it should be called a piss star because it's a star that's taking the piss. <laughs> I just want to mention the talk I did for Cafe Scientific. Mm. Yeah, how did that go? Or Cyber Cafe Scientific. I think it went well. Yeah, there were um, lots of really good questions. Actually, it was a nice format because. Um, we sort of did questions as we went along, so it was via Zoom, um, and like you know, the moderator just sort of interrupted me and fired questions at me as of when, uh, which is a lot nicer. It's nicer to have that sort of interactiveness than kind of just talking to the void, especially mm -hmm. when it's yeah. all online. Because when you're in a room with people, you can at least kind of make eye contact and force them to stay awake. Whereas when it's remote, you haven't got a clue whether people are actually there or if they've just like buggered off to go and play with the dog or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, um, I think it. I think it went quite well. It's on YouTube. Oh, is it? And on their website now. Yeah, yeah. So um, if anyone missed it, and so what should we Google or search for on YouTube? Uh, Cyber Cafe Scientific. Oh, their YouTube channel will come up. Uh, if you Google Cafe Scientific and Jenny, and Google results must include Jenny, it's the first result you get too. In this talk, Jenny will take us through a world into the hidden universe. There you are. Scientifique in the French yeah. way. So it's uh, it's kind of like the little extra segment that we're doing in the um, episodes, the electromagnetic spectrum. It's like that, but can super condensed, um, with, and without kind of all the information about the telescopes and the detector technology. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it went down pretty well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as of the day we're recording this, which will be a couple of days ago, as this is released. Um, you're on BBC Wales and BBC Glamorgan again, aren't you? Tarting yourself no, out on the BBC. Gloucester? Yeah, Gloucester, not Glamorgan. Well, I'm branching out. Yes, Gloucester, sorry. Branching out, I am. Yeah, so um, I've had another call. Gloucester's essentially part of Wales anyway. <laughs> uh, well, it's branching out from my point of view. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I had another call from the BBC um, asking me to talk about SpaceX. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing. At, the f at first, it was going to be at like half past six in the morning. Um, it was supposed to be, you know, just after the first launch on the, the 27th, um, which didn't happen. So I was like, oh, God, yeah, OK, that's fine. You know, quietly dying inside. Uh, but these ones are at the much more reasonable time of 20 past eight and then 20 to nine in the morning. Um, so yeah, just gonna we're gonna talk about SpaceX, the launch, why it's so important, uh, things like that. Really, what they're gonna do when they get up to the ISS, all that jazz. But we're not gonna talk about that here because that's for next episode, right? Oh, when yeah. you know, fingers crossed, the launch should have happened <laughs> by then. Uh, it, it's and commercial we'll crew. It happen. It's commercial crew. It won't have happened by then. I well, the, I mean, I've been looking at the weather reports, and mm. they're not looking great. No, it's not good. Again, I, I a pound to a pinch of crap. It's not going to launch on Saturday. Yeah, and Sunday's not looking good either. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Either way, I'm going to be on on the air. But <laughs> and that's not all that, that matters. it matters because by the time this goes out, it's going to have been and gone anyway. But yeah, and I actually get a little bit of money for it, which is nice. Ooh. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's not it's thirty-two pound. I seem to what? get paid. That's a bizarre figure. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Very nice. I don't know why, but yeah, I, well, I got thirty-two quid for the last feature, so I'm assuming I'll get thirty-two quid this time as well. But to get you. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's enough for a takeaway, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll take that. Um, are we looking forward while we're on the subject of you know SpaceX and uh, manned missions and stuff like that? Are we looking forward to Space Force? on Netflix I am is that the Steve Carell thing mm. I am looking forward to it it looks good it does look very funny oh yeah I'm so looking forward to it yeah because um, uh, as we're recording it's a couple couple of days isn't it and then it comes out so I reckon we'll be able to talk about it next time and it's got one of my mm. favourite actors of all time and it's got John Malkovich in it so 
It, How was it? <laughs> ah, he never picks a bad thing, so it's got to be good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, I think it's going to be great. Yeah. I don't know how well it's going to go down with the president, though. <laughs> Who cares? He's gone mad. He's clearly gone mad. <gasps> he has. He's completely he? oh lost the plot today. So, but we're not going to get into that. But pff, no. he's gone full tonto today. <laughs> and one final bit of TV because what else is there to do at the minute other than you know TV? Um, has anyone been watching History One Hundred and One on Netflix? No, but I have seen it on Net. I've seen it, you know, oh kind of being gosh. advertised. But no, I've not been watching it. So good. Highly recommend it. They oh, just really? seem to pick really random subjects from, mm. from history and just talk about it for 20 minutes. So there's like there's an episode on plastics and then there's an episode on the rise of China and then there's an episode on the space race. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, it's a really eclectic collection of just random interesting bits of history. But yeah, the second episode is on the space race and it's a nice little 20 minute summary mm. of, you know, the whole Cold War and... and and everything between um, America and Russia. And, it, you know, it does nice little summaries of all the the goals that were met on the way to the moon. Um, yeah, so I recommend that for, you know, 20 minutes. Eat it while you watch your dinner or something. It's good. Yeah, cool. So should we move on to the emails? Why not? Yeah, why not? So uh, I guess it's a, a product of having such really good skies recently. The skies have been fantastic. I don't know if it's oh, the same. Oh, the weather been great? Oh, well, uh, marvellous. The, I don't know about Wales, but the, the it's official today. It's the longest period of dry, clear weather in modern English history. Today, since since, since the records that. began, um, we've hit, uh, was it 573 hours of sunshine? Essentially, so I think I to hell with that. the economy, mm. amateur astronomers should all club together and be petitioning eternal lockdown. Mm. <laughs> clearly, 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 yeah, yeah. 573, and, the, and that's for May, um, that, and the, we haven't got to the end of May yet, so the record's going to be huge. Yeah. Yeah, the, the record, yeah. The record yeah. was about 500, so it's now 573, so it's way wow. past... I can believe that because I cannot remember the last time we had such good weather in like April no. and May. Like That's ever. I can't ever remember it. I can remember snow happening in April, not yeah. like glorious sunshine. It's got to be the lack of aircraft, the lack of vehicles, the lack of industry putting stuff into the atmosphere that, you know, clouds will then seed around. It has to be. I mean, it's just too much of a coincidence or now. Climate change! Climate change. <laughs> <laughs> but I, no, I am convinced, Ralph, that there is something to do with like less pollutants in the air, like yeah. less dust being kicked up. I am convinced. Like, I'm sure that there are people, climate scientists, atmospheric scientists out there screaming now into the void going, no, Jen, correlation is not causation. And I know that. I think it's just a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> really? After all this time, though? Yeah. <laughs> hey, it, it, it's just coincidence. Well, if, if anybody does know for certain and isn't just uh, a Twitter warrior, then do yeah. let us know. Yeah. Let us know one way or the other what the actual yeah. scientific I mean, answer is for this. Is it just yeah. Yeah. freak meteorology or is it something to do with fewer pollutants in the air? Yeah, I would be really interested to know. Anyway. Anyway. So this has led to quite a few astronomy newbies uh, reaching out to us on Twitter recently. Mm. Uh, so it might be a good idea to discuss our good friend Peter Johnson's tweet, um, which kind of encapsulates quite a few of the uh, the messages we've had, who says, as a complete astronomy novice with a simple telescope, what can I easily find in the night sky other than the moon and Venus? And I just want to, before I open this up to everybody, I just want to to give my kind of potted view on this which is basically anything that means you're going to get uh, excited by what you see because there's nothing worse than people either setting up a telescope and um and not being able to set it up properly because the kit's mm. too uh, complicated or not being able to get good views or picking objects that you, you you can't see because it's out of the reach of your telescope or it's beyond the conditions that you're yeah. viewing. Yeah. And then that telescope never coming out again. So I would say always, always, always start with things that are really bright. Go for the gas giants, Saturn and Jupiter, which are starting to, to look quite good again now. Um, Definitely. And then for the deep sky stuff, really looking at your winter stuff like your, your uh, the Orion Nebula, uh, globular clusters, open clusters, plenty of those around during the summer globular clusters and open clusters yeah. but go for the things that were really bright i would say yeah absolutely def, def, don't don't go chasing 
galaxies and faint nebula and things like that you you mm. just you even if your scope is capable you're not going to see them because you don't you, you've just not practiced enough to know what you're looking mm. for how to find it what it should look like in the scope and you go for something really difficult you're never you're not going to find it get really frustrated yeah and you're going to be expecting uh, hubble resolution and yeah. you'll be so underwhelmed um, unless yeah. you do go for those bright objects. Yeah. And don't ignore the craters on the uh, uh, the ever-shifting details on the moon as the shadows mm. move from each night. The moon is just a fantastic object. You know, every yeah. night it will look different. And, you know, you can look for some of the uh, the more stranger features like the, the, the shadows that the Apennine Mountains cast or the uh, that X feature or the mm. sword shape of, uh, of features on the moon. There's a lot of stuff that you can, you can really start teasing out on the yeah. moon. And, of course... The moon always looks fantastic through a telescope, probably less so when it's full, but certainly yeah. when you've got and that nice Terminator line. And this is a great time because you've got, you got Saturn is just oh, through June is going to be basically coming up about 10 o'clock in the evening. Uh, we'll yeah. talk about the Sky Guide later on. So actually, when it's actually dark from sort of 11 midnight, perfect time to see, see Saturn sitting over in the east. Really easy to find. Jupiter will be right yeah. next to it. That's that's really nice to go and see. Mars won't be far behind it if you want to pull a slightly later one. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, hunting down some of the big clusters. Hercules, the great cluster in Hercules M13. That's actually a very easy find. Even so you, can be, you can see it naked eye on a dark night, but you can see it yeah. in a pair of binoculars. Auriga's nice and high with three good bright clusters, open clusters in there. Yeah, exactly. Look at Ursa Major. Ursa Major is right over at Zenith at the moment. Um, so even just looking at you know binary stars and sort of jumping around the plow, even just looking at the stars there and, and the and you might be able to pick up a couple of the brighter galaxies there if you've got a, you know a reasonable bit of aperture. You don't need much um, yeah. to pick up things like M ninety seven, especially if you're in a dark sky, the, the Al Nebula, and yeah, exactly, um, and M one hundred six things like that. You're not they they're not terribly difficult, but yeah, I mean it's, it's I think the the biggest thing is being realistic, isn't it? It's being realistic and probably treating yourself to a decent decent guide um phillips do really nice yeah um astronomy guides there's ones they do for small telescopes um it's a really good guide it's one i recommend regularly is the phillips small scope guide um and of course turn left at orion turn left at orion is the sort of step by step how to sort of go around the sky season by season month by month find the kind of the the, the nice objects that that small scopes can find and big scopes but to, to work mm. your way around those those objects in in various constellations is a great book i still use it yeah. i still go, go yeah that's been the bible for decades but it yeah. still stands the test of time i would also say there's plenty of free night sky apps as well you don't have to there is. To, to pay money for night sky apps mm. um and stellarium still free um which is probably the best bit of software oh, it's um, planetarium and night sky software that you can put on your on your computer I was going to say, I will put a shout out for Sky Guide because if you download Sky Guide, as long as you've got an Apple device, you can read my articles that I write for them. <laughs> and who wouldn't want to do that? Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. I think it's only a couple of quid um, for the basic version. So, um, But they have all sorts of cool like 3D models of things and like virtual reality stuff and things like that in there. Yeah, um, very cool. As well. yep. Good shout, Gem. But... I also want to just wave the flag for double stars mm. because I think double stars are something that small telescopes can do very, very nicely yeah. and they're often yeah. overlooked, um, especially when you can get ones, you know, that have like the two-colour dichotomy. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, double stars are always a good one for small telescopes. And it's also quite a fun thing to do to test the resolving power of your telescope. You know, you can find double stars which are closer and closer and closer together and see where's the limit at which I can resolve yeah. these stars into the you know the two separate stars, or you know can I only see them as one? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's a it's a nice little test to do, and also even through a small telescope, the full moon or the nearly full moon can be very very bright. So having a polarizing filter is is nice. They're really cheap, yeah. Um, but it can just kind of ease yeah ease the strain on your eye a little bit, yeah. so you're not kind of like seeing the moon for about half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> looking at it. I, it also helps reveal some of the detail as well actually you, you can see some of the, the, the different colors yeah. and, and and shading on the moon by using a at so any any point in its phase it's um it, it sort of helps reveal some of the other other things you can't normally see yeah 
Uh, my, my top tip though would be if you're beginning out in astronomy and this is something that I found when I was starting out was a real real help was um, for the first year at least um, buy some astronomy magazines if you're in the UK yeah. I would start oh, yeah. off with BBC Sky at Night magazine because uh, it's probably the most beginner friendly one and then mm -hmm. graduate to astronomy now I like all yeah. about space as well yeah astronomy now astronomy okay. now is the standard that's a good one I like that one uh, in America, you've got Sky and Telescope, which is a great magazine and astronomy mm. magazine. But I would say certainly read one of those every month and, and along with downloading 365 Days of Astronomy every day with a different podcast every day mm. um, from different providers. It just really builds up your knowledge of not only what you're seeing, but how the universe works. And it's it's that's a really good way to build your knowledge up. And, yeah. and, yeah. and that helps you get a better, get more out of the night sky, I think. Yeah, and and do you know what? Dig out, um, go to your library, go to secondhand books, things like that. One of the old um, like Patrick Moore beginners guides. There's various ones he wrote over the years, and they are really readable. And he does take you through how to do astronomy. If there was, there was sort of one thing that he was very very good at was basically holding the hand of an amateur and taking them through how to do it. Hmm. Um, and yeah. there's there's a couple of his books I have on my shelf that I, I've regularly recommend to people um he's like sort of beginner's guides he wrote um and they're brilliant they're really really readable they're just a really nice reads as well um, and they'll they'll kind of give you that nice basic knowledge of of how to do astronomy and what you should look for and and he was very very good at setting your expectations at the right level as well Mm. Um, yeah, and, and that's that's really key. What you were saying earlier about the Hubble thing—it's it, you know making sure you don't don't expect miracles, especially in those first you know few months when you've got your telescope. Yeah, Patrick Moore really was the master at that. Mm, completely. One time when I was at the hub, I mean, I've got a sixteen-inch dob. You can see some quite faint details in that, and I was showing people the ring nebula, and this guy walked up and went, "Yeah, but you can see it on the internet, better." Oh, oh, it's not the point. And I nearly leathered him. <laughs> it <was just> like... <laughs> and uh, while we're on the subject of emails and uh, tweets and contact that we've had, um, I feel like I owe it to my fellow humans to uh, ask this question, which is from our good friend Andy Burns. And he says, are you still planning to invade, given that it appears you could be defeated by bacteria? Mm. Minute, invisible bacteria, or are you willing to brave our microscopic allies? We've got a good one on the go at the moment. So what's the, what's the verdict, Martians? Invasion's still happening? It ain't bacteria, it's virus. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, look, I was just quoting that. Yeah, but, <laughs> Don't but shoot you know, messenger. You know, no fear. I, well, I'm, I'm staying at home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping that cylinder firmly locked away. Yeah. <laughs> Once bitten. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what? Um, there was a, a um, Tom Holland, the uh, the uh, historian. You know Tom Holland. He's, he's quite a famous mm. historian. Um, and he did on Bank Holiday at the beginning of May. Fantastic thing. Because of course the streets of London were completely deserted. He went for a walk, and he live tweeted the end of the H.G. Wells War of the World novel. Really. Where the 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 journalist who who narrates the book walks through the deserted London, you know, where he decides he's going to basically give himself to the Martians. That's it. He's had enough. He's gonna he's gonna end it all. And yeah. he walks through the streets of London. And in, in in the book, he describes in quite detail the wells, the kind of the route he took. And so Holland followed it. Right. Holland followed it. And every time there was a quote from the book about a location in London, he he took a picture of this deserted street hmm. of course at like you know sort of seven eight o'clock in the morning in london and it was brilliant because it was it was all these locations and these descriptions at wells there were still things that wells had described that were still there like this row of white cottages and things like that as he sort of made his way through well, that's uh, awesome. uh through up to um um thingy bob hill um what's the hill that overlooks london um, primrose primrose hill where where the uh martians have their encampment um and he 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 live tweeted the whole thing like this route through London. It was brilliant. It was fantastic to follow. Um, oh, lovely! It, it, was, it was a brilliant thing to do. So, should we go on to the news? Why not?
Ralph, uh, you're going to kick us off with the news this time, and uh, I think you're taking us back in time to the early universe, mm-hmm. right? Yes. With a, well, I think is a very interesting discovery. So, go on, my Martian matey. Wow us. Right, okay, so... One of the hot topics in astronomy is understanding galaxy formation and peering back to see the earliest galaxies form with ever more powerful telescopes. And that's one of the great revelations of Hubble's wide field images. Being able to see thousands of galaxies in a single image means we can see the lifeline of galaxies and the further away the galaxies are, the older they are typically. And observations from our largest telescopes prop up the theory that the earliest large-scale structures in the universe were these spherical clumps of dark matter that collapsed under their own gravity. Then large concentrations of gas fell into these dark matter clumps, exploding to form stars and ultimately galaxies. What's less well known is why some galaxies, like our own Milky Way, have physical structures that are dominated by disks of stars and gas, whereas others, generally older and more dormant galaxies, don't. What is well known, though, is that these galactic structures began around 3 billion years after the Big Bang. Or that was well known for about five years, until a team of astronomers using the ALMA radio telescope detected light emitted from cold gas in a galaxy from around 12.5 billion years ago. They were able to examine the structure of the gas and apply simple and reliable analytic models to show that their observations are consistent with the presence of huge but stable rotating gas disks with stars and dust. Which is super exciting. Exactly, because that means galactic structures, or galaxies as we know them, seem to have formed just one and a half billion years after the Big Bang, or in half the time we previously thought... Oh, and that's so not exciting. just, you know, that's not just a couple of hundred thousand years or a couple of million years. That's halving the time we thought. And that was really early on in the universe as well. It is, you know, a phenomenally quick period to suddenly go from, you know, everything spread out everywhere to having these, you know, nice rotating structures. Yeah. Um, and I've, you know, I've had a look at the plots in this paper and, um, like it is it's beautiful it's it's you look at it and it's wonderfully uniform and stuff it's you know exactly what you would expect for a rotating galaxy and yeah super exciting i really like this story because it's like my sort of field and it's not very often that these sorts of um things make the headlines because at the minute it's all about exoplanets right yeah Um, this this is just cosmologist porn isn't it oh it's amazing gives me a boner (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> is there something you want to tell us about yourself <laughs> maybe maybe not <laughs> okay so next up from me is a team of astronomers using the european southern observatory's 2.2 meter telescope at the la Silla observatory in chile which has been studying double star systems and it stumbled on an interesting quirk in one system called hr 6819 in the constellation of telescopium Now, the team originally observed this as part of a study of double star systems. However, as they analysed their observations, they were surprised when they revealed a third previously undiscovered body there. Um, Hey, that's nice. Well, it's even better than that, because calculating the orbits of the stars in the system, it was apparent that there's also an invisible object there with a mass of at least four times that of the sun. And that can only be a black hole. So they found a black hole here which is actually the discovery of one of the very first stellar mass black holes appearing truly black as it's not interacting violently with its environment like most do. Mm. And the discovery of such triple systems could also help us understand more about violent cosmic mergers because where there's a triple system with an inner pair made of two black holes or a black hole and a neutron star, they can gravitationally impact, triggering a huge release of gravitational waves that we're only now just able to detect on Earth with gravitational wave detectors. But what makes this great for amateur astronomers is that the system is so close to us that its stars can be viewed from the southern hemisphere on a dark, clear night without mm. binoculars or a telescope. Oh, yes. Nice. First naked eye location of a black hole exactly Mm. so as ESO scientist Thomas Ravinius who led the study says this system contains the nearest black hole to earth that we know of but they also say this system could just be the tip of the iceberg as many more similar black holes 
are likely to be found in the future using this method. Hmm. Hmm. Ooh. Yeah, there'll be one. Paul. There'll be ones closer. There'll be ones closer than that. That's two cracking stories, Ralph. Mm. Really great stories. Go on then, Paul. Beat them. Right. So, is the sun unusual? No. Well. Yes. This is the question that a team <laughs> at the Max Planck Institute have been looking into because the analysis of sun-like stars in Kepler and Gaia data will seem to suggest so. So the astronomers ah, led by Timo so Reinhold um, looked at 369 sun-like stars that they could see in the data and looked at their rotational variations in brightness um, to sort of look at the, the, their energy output of these stars. Now, they didn't just look at the brightness variation, um, as this, of course, varies with all sorts of things like spot activity, transiting objects. Shut it with your dust, my lord. Um, I mean, so, it's true, but it does affect it. So looking at rotational speed variation was more useful. So the sun's activity fluctuates by 0.07% over 24 days. Um, and this is tied up with the magnetic field and the dynamo effect created by the sun's rotation. Um, and so it is for all stars. Therefore, by knowing the rotational speed, you can learn a certain amount about the fluctuations in the star's output, compare it to the brightness, things like that. Mm. Okay, so far so good. So well, when you do this analysis for the sun-like stars in the Kepler data, then the sun comes out as an outlier with all of the stars, and I mean all of these 369 stars, coming out of the analysis with much greater fluctuations in rotation, therefore much greater levels of activity and output. So the sun is unusual. Don't. Right. But perhaps not, mm. because yeah. of course, <laughs> this analysis has some limitations, as the team admit. Um, the stars in question are, in a sense, self-selected because they are sun-like stars that were visible in a patch of sky that Kepler was staring at for four years. So this mm. is a very small group of stars, and the data is a four-year snapshot. We yes. know that the sun has varied in output through its life from sort of four centuries of telescope views and thousands of years. We know it's varied because of tree rings and ice cores and things like that. Mm. So maybe these stars are not representative or maybe the sun is just having a quiet period of its life by comparison. So there we are. Or perhaps not, because the team have looked <laughs> further <laughs> because they are scientists doing science and they had a look at another 2,500 sun-like stars that didn't have defined rotation periods, but had a look at their brightness. Now, as the team points out, not all these stars have rotation periods like the sun. Some will be faster, some will be slower, but of course many will fall in that 20 to 30 day bracket. And what stands out from this data is the sun is pretty normal, and many sun-like stars appear to have a comparable output level. So that's that then. Hmm. No, it, it really is this time. Um, <laughs> follow, yeah, lots of follow-up work, more data to gather, and there is work being done on the impact of all this on life and life evolving on planets. But the answer to the question of is the sun unusual and therefore is the Earth rare, this is sort of rare, rare Earth hypothesis, um, it appears probably not, but... That can't, yeah. you know. um, so this was in the Journal of Science, if you want to follow it up. Now... Black holes are like buses. You wait ages for a good black hole story, then three come along at once. And of course, Ralph's already done one. Um, so, how about another quick black hole roundup? Which sounds like. Oh, why not? Yes, exactly. Which sounds like an epic sci fi cowboy mashup we've all been waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, first up from me is a star that mimics Mercury as it orbits the supermassive black hole in our galactic centre. Star S2 has been trapped for years with a VLT, and astronomers at Max mm. Planck, led by Reinhard Genzel, um, have seen that it pr processes around the black hole just as Mercury does around the sun, making that nice little sort of flower pattern. Huh. Yeah, once again confirming general relativity. The star has a 16-year orbit and approaches uh, as close as 120 astronomical units, or 20 billion kilometres. Now hang on, I hear you cry. Uh, that far out, 16-year orbit, yeah, this thing at its closest approach is moving at 3% the speed of light. Ooh. Oh. I know, imagine a star. <laughs> See what, you want a pair of goggles, don't you? Yeah, yeah you, th that. there'll be a few flies on your face. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> and I'm guessing that'll be tidally locked as well, will it, to the black hole? I don't know, actually. It's a very good question. It's a very good question. It hasn't occurred to me, but yeah, possibly. I don't know. It's a long way. I mean, mm. actually, it is a long way out. I mean... 100, that, it that's, is, but it's a big old gravitational that's, pull. <laughs> that's a little bit close. That's a little bit closer to that that object than uh, Voyager One is to the Sun. Yeah, yeah. that's a long. I wonder if it gets long way out. 
if it's moving at three percent of the speed of light, do you reckon it's going to get its shape distorted at all? Oh, I I would have thought so. Is it it. it if it if if it's getting that much pull from the black hole as it as it gets to its closest mm. point, I would have thought it would be. But yeah, yeah. it's yeah. it's, it's going to be down to the gravitational effects well, rather than relativistic effects. It's not going fast enough for relativistic effects. I wouldn't have well, thought. no, no, no. There there would surely be a small amount of compression due to that, wouldn't it? From from a relative Probably point of view, not measurable. From though, a relative right. point of view, anyway. Anyway. Probably not much. Bit of speculation, though. but yeah, okay. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. And then the last one for me to round up our three black holes in one news news uh, thing is is a, a LIGO ping. Oh, uh, this I time like the form. Ping. Yeah, love a LIGO ping. The form of a black hole merger between black holes of unequal mass that confirms you've guessed it, general relativity. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> GR. You know what? I really think they're being a little bit shady about general relativity because they keep testing it. <laughs> I, I, do you know what? Do you know what? It, it, it's like they're really unsure about it. Um, it's because there's so many they, all... heads on Twitter. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> saying general I've relativity got, doesn't exist. I can prove I've you got a wrong. new theory of gravity. Would you like me to send it to you? Um, yeah. Anyway, GR predicts that in this sort of event, this unequal mass black hole there will be a gravitational wave produced at much higher frequencies than had been seen so far by LIGO and so it came to pass there had been previous black hole mergers detected but these were near mass examples so this is GW190412 snappy title um, Mm -hmm. of the 12th of April 2019 clue in the name if you read it back Um, (laughs) it was a merger of an 8 solar mass black hole and a 30 mass solar mass black hole somewhere between 1.9 and 2.9 billion light years away which is quite far really that's a big old chunk of the universe there. that's a big old chunk of the universe and this once again as so much of my news comes from Max Planck as well as LIGO <laughs> nice there endeth the lesson people and now we're going for something completely different for the big story and um, this is the the planet in Auriga I did like this. Or is it? Mm. 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 Okay, so um, this is a story that sort of hit the headlines because it has, quite frankly, one of the most exquisite photos that I have ever seen. That's, you know, actual real data, not a simulation. Um, and this is um, the star AB Origae, um, which is in the constellation of Origa. And um, they have, it's surrounded by this great big disk of gas and dust. And this has been known about for some time. Mm. Um, The star is 520 light years from Earth. Um, So, you know, reasonably close. And the latest images come from the VLT, or the Very Large Telescope, which is up in Chile. And this telescope operates in the near infrared. And um, in this image, if you haven't seen it, go and look it up um, because you can see just beautiful spiral arms um, in this great big thick um, gas and dust disk that surrounds a star. And we know about these spiral arms. These have been seen before in other images like those taken by ALMA. Um, So the fact that this spiral arm exists, these spiral arms exist in the disk is not new. But what is new is that by using the instrument called Sphere on the VLT, they have managed to see a twist in these spiral arms. Mm -hmm. And this twist is where they think an exoplanet is being formed, which I think is like super, super exciting that we've actually got an image of an exoplanet being formed. So um, I feel like it's... Before you go any further, and and I know there's a a poo-poo moment coming up, even (laughs) if it isn't, the image is amazing. Oh, it's a fantastic image. It, it truly is. Just incredible. The, the the level of detail of of stuff going around a star yeah. that far away is it's exquisite. It's amazing. Yeah, definitely. Go and have a look at it if you haven't seen it already. Mm. Um But it's probably best just to quote one of the, the authors on the paper, which is Anne Dutry. Um and she says that the twist is expected from some theoretical models of planet formation. Mm -hmm. It corresponds to the connection of two spirals, one winding inwards of the planet's orbit and the other expanding outwards, which join at the planet's location. Mm -hmm. They allow gas and dust from the disk to accrete onto the forming planet and make it grow. It's amazing. Which I can can believe that. 
Yeah, makes yeah. sense to me. Mm. Yeah, you can see it. And um, so they they conclude that um, the planet is forming uh, about the distance of Neptune from its star, so thirty astronomical units, mm-hmm. and they reckon it's got a mass of between sort of four and thirteen Jupiter masses. Wow, they're hedging the bets or there, aren't they? Ha- yeah, <laughs> mm. yeah. <laughs> small, small, or small. Has it? Because not many people seem to have picked up on this. Um, but when this, you know, because I check the archive every day, it's just part of my daily work routine. And um, so this popped up, but also another paper popped up on the archive at the same time. And this paper has been resubmitted to monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society after it's done its corrections. And they reckon it's actually a second star. Oh. Not a planet. Yeah. Give it another 100,000 years and we'll know. Yeah. <laughs> And this seems to have been glossed over a little bit. Um, now, they use completely different observations. They have a look at the system using um, carbon monoxide emissions. So they're using mm-hmm. ALMA. So it is, again, you know, a super high resolution image. Mm. And they reckon that the, the spiral arm structure can be explained by a binary star, which is located um, at 40 astronomical units. So, you know, similar distance, um, with a stellar mass of about a quarter of that of AB or Rige, which is about 0.6 of the mass of the mm-hmm, sun, mm-hmm. Um, which is, you know, significantly more massive than the predicted planet mass um, yeah. because the mass of the sun is about a thousand Jupiters, right? So it's the lower end of a red dwarf. No, higher Upper end. end. Upper end. Yeah. So isn't it interesting? Same system, same spiral features, mm. two very different conclusions. Yeah, mm. and, and and there is science, isn't it? Yeah, and of course this and means the- that more telescope time is going to be dedicated to this, so we will mm. know for sure at some point in the mm. in the coming year or so. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, it's a great story. Yeah, yeah. So, Sky Guide. This is the part of the show where we help you navigate the night sky in all its twinkling awesomeness. Whether you're observing from Earth or from Mars, uh, just make sure you're two metres away from the nearest living thing, right? We give you full permission to stick them with the pointy end if they don't back off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little asterisk there. No, we actually don't. Um, so our constellation of choice for this month is serpents, which in Latin means, guess what? the serpent which you know is great because number one it's a constellation name that i can pronounce and number two it's actually pretty straightforward in terms of you know what it sounds like and what it looks like because it actually looks like some what it's supposed to yeah although you might not yet know where this constellation is um or how to find it it is absolutely chock-a-block with some really great observing targets so i guarantee that this is going to be a patch of sky you'll find yourself returning to time and time again um well for as long as you can anyway because it's not going to be too long till the sky just doesn't get dark enough for proper observing so um yeah sucks being at high northern latitudes doesn't it uh anyway take it away paul right well serpents well here is one of those constellations that is a great pub quiz fact people it's the only constellation divided into two parts with another constellation between them. How about that? Ah. Huh. So, to find serpents, you really need to find a ficus, who is the man holding said serpent in the sky. So, this is constellation is um, a collection of stars below Hercules. So, if you find Hercules, that's, that's you find the bright stars of Vega in Lyra and Arcturus in Bertes. Look between them, you should find... Um, Hercules, and then if you look below, you'll find a sort of circle, squash circle, kind of bell shape, and it's quite big, it's much bigger than Hercules, of a ficus. Um, now, on the right of that, that kind of loop, that bell loop, um, as you look back towards Arcturus, you should see a line of stars, sort of zigzag line of stars, leading to a small triangle of stars right underneath Hercules, and this is Serpent's Caput, which is the head of the serpent. Um, on the left hand side of a ficus there is a less distinct line of stars roughly pointing an altair and aquila and almost rising to the height kind of parallel to a ficus almost rising to the height of a ficus and this is serpent's calder which is the tail. Um, the bright stars are in the head section which makes the tail actually quite a difficult find it's, it's actually quite a faint line of stars. The Greek story of the serpent is that it's the snake that taught Asclepius the secret of reviving the dead 
the Babylonians saw it as a horned serpent and a, dr- a dragon hybrid, bizarrely. Um, God knows what they were smoking. Um, while the Chinese astronomers see it as a wall around a marketplace known as Tianxi. So there you are, hmm. Ralph. Oh, okay, for the deep sky this month, I'll start with a criminally overlooked globular cluster in Serpens, Messier 5, or NGC 5904. This glob was discovered in 1702 by Gottfried Kirk, although he was more interested in a nearby comet. Charles Messier charted it, trying to avoid comets, and Herschel resolved it as a cluster. It's actually a vast dense ball of up to a half a million stars, 25,000 light years away, that under the right conditions is naked eye visible as it has an apparent magnitude of just over six. To find it, look for star 109 Virginis and 16 degrees east, the star Alpha Serpentis, or Unukalhai. Drawing a line between these stars and finding halfway, M5 should be an easy find just below the line you've drawn. It's 165 light years across, which translates into 23 arc seconds in the scope. Interestingly, this is one of the oldest globulars dated at 13 billion years old and contains at least 105 variable stars. The brightest and most easily observed of these has a period of 26 and a half days and a magnitude variance of between 10.6 and 12.1. For the keen-eyed and large-scoped, look out for a smaller, fainter globular, Palomar 5, which is just to the south of Messier 5 and has a parent magnitude of 11.75. This glob has an elongated shape due to it probably being torn apart by the gravity of the core of the Milky Way, and it's leaving a 30,000 light-year star stream, which extends well past Messier 5. I I can say Messier 5, one of my favourites. Really, really good target. Yeah, it's everybody goes for Messier 13, but this one's really worth picking out. Yeah, and with Palomar 5 just there as well, it's really cool. It's a really cool target. Why wouldn't you? I yeah. highly recommend it. Yeah. So my next pick in Serpens never rises much higher than around 25 degrees above the horizon from the UK, and you'll probably want to wait until after 11 o'clock before it's really dark enough to see it this month. But for me, this is the summer astrophotography target, something that the Hubble Space Telescope made a beeline for in its first year of operation. And if you've only seen one of Hubble's stunning images, it's likely to be this, the Pillars of Creation in the Eagle Nebula. Of course, you're not going to get the same resolution as the Hubble Space Telescope, but an 8-inch amateur scope will still reveal the wispy emission nebula with a dark band in the middle, this dark band being the 9.5 light-year long columns of gas and dust that make up the famous pillars. To find the Eagle Nebula, also catalogued as Messier 16, draw an imaginary line between the two bright stars Altair in Aquila and Antares in Scorpio, Just a degree below the halfway point, the nebula should be within the field of view of a low-power eyepiece. Being low in the sky and often ignored, you'll be surprised you've not sorted it out before, especially if you have a go at imaging it. Just an hour's worth of exposures with a 4-inch refractor will give you detail that will astound you. Bright and expansive and the dark pillars of gas so pronounced that you really can see why it's called the Eagle Nebula. Nice. Go on then, Paul. Tell us about the solar system. Right, so if you want evening planets, then it's Mercury you want. Um, I know many of you have been enjoying the brief Venus-Mercury conjunction the end of May, um, which was spectacular, it was really beautiful. Um, and now Venus has vanished mm. into the glare of the sun. It's just Mercury left holding the torch. It reaches greatest eastern elongation, which is its furthest from the sun, um, on the 4th of June. It's about magnitude 1 to just above 0, um, and in the evening summer glare, it's not the easiest find. Despite the distance from the sun, the ecliptic of course, being summer, is flat to the horizon, so Mercury is not actually gaining much altitude. Grab your view in the first two weeks of the month because by the second half of June, it will be a real struggle as it retreats back towards the sun. Um, The Great Conjunction is building nicely in the morning. Um, This is the once every 20 year meetup of Saturn and Jupiter in our skies. Now, the actual conjunction isn't until December, which of course, when it'll be down with rain. But until then, (laughs) we've been watching the two great giants getting ever closer in the pre-dawn sky um they're actually rising above the horizon ever earlier and by the end of june we're popping up in the east at 10 p.m mm. which means they're in the darker skies you don't need nice. yeah exactly you don't need to be up with the dark to see them uh, following behind them is mars which is still rising after midnight but it's growing larger all the time because of course we're coming up to opposition in the autumn and by the end of june has probably stopped 
being the small red speck of disappointment that it is for so much of the time. Um, and some of the bigger, brighter details, like the polar caps and things, will start to hove into view for smaller scopes. It starts month in Aquarius and moves rapidly east towards Pisces through June. Um, mm, nice. I'm going to say Comet Swan. Laugh a bit. <laughs> say good <laughs> luck. Um, it'll be moving out of the sunset sky and at the start of June is in Auriga by the Star Capella. But, you know, for you might see it. A couple it. of weeks later, it'll have broken up and you won't be able yeah, to see exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. You might see it. So I might be wrong and it'll be the most spectacular comet since... The last one. Of this but, century. Well, yeah, this century. Yeah, like the last two one. Two suns in the sky. Yeah. Um, un- it will not be it like won't. two suns in the um, sky. But anyway, there we go. <laughs> Ralph. Okay, so we have three meteor showers to tell you about this month. First up is the Aretids, which runs from mid-May to the end of June, peaking on the 8th of June, with around 30 per hour under ideal conditions. Sadly... There are no ideal conditions for the Aretids, as the radiant in Aries is only 30 degrees from the sun, so the best time to look is about an hour before the sun rises. It's thought the Aretids may come from the debris left in the wake of the sun-grazing asteroid Icarus, or maybe from a comet that broke up a thousand years ago. We just don't know. Now, next up is the Tau Herculids, which peak on the following night, the 9th of June. This meteor shower was only discovered in 1930, and it's not a new one like the Camelopardalids, so this pretty much tells you how excited you should get for this shower. (laughs) As the name suggests, this shower radiates from Hercules, which is well-placed, nice and high this time of year. However, with a zenithal hourly rate of just three, the most exciting thing about this... (laughs) Yeah, exactly. The most exciting (laughs) thing about this meteor shower is that you get to say it comes from the debris from Comet Schwassmann (laughs) Wachmann. Ooh, nice. Oh, and did I mention that the moon's up on the ninth too? Still, something to watch out for as you enjoy that wonderful close triangle of the moon, Jupiter and Saturn on the 9th of June. I can't wait for that. That, Ooh, that'd be good. That's going to be the most spectacular shower of the year. (laughs) <laughs> so we'll finish with the last of the meteor showers peaking in June the June Buertids which have a short window running from late June to early July and peaking on the 27th of June this is the debris left behind short period comet 7P Pons Winnaker. typically we only see one or two meteors per hour but Whoa. that's <sighs> low but the June Buertids are really unpredictable with more than 100 an hour witnessed in 1998 Blimey. Yeah, so that's variable. <laughs> by by one man who had just been to see his dealer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've not verified who it was. <laughs> the moon sets around midnight on the 27th of June, and with Boerties being nice and highly placed in the sky, any time from 1am to an hour before sunrise would make a good time to see if we're getting one of those rare spike years. Hmm. So, for the moon phases this month, we have full moon on the 5th, last quarter on the 13th, new moon on the 21st, and first quarter on the 28th. So, clear skies and happy hunting. Okay, so this time on our journey through the electromagnetic spectrum, we are diving into the near and mid infrared skies. We're talking wavelengths from about 700 nanometers, so right at the limit of what we can see with our eyes, right at the red end of the visible spectrum, down to about 30 microns, which marks the boundary with the far infrared submillimeter that we talked about last time. Again, because it's infrared light, we're talking about heat energy, but things are a little bit warmer compared to what we discussed before. Uh, This is because the warmer an object, the shorter the wavelength it emits most of its light at, which is true for the whole electromagnetic spectrum, not just the infrared. And this is why something that's very cold, like interstellar dust, radiates most of its energy at submillimeter wavelengths, but warmer things, like humans or Martians, will instead glow brightly at these shorter infrared wavelengths. So it's about 10 microns for humans, which is about one-fifth of the width of a human hair. And I'm yet to turn the infrared camera on the Martians because I am genuinely worried about scarring myself for life. (laughs) But anyway, in terms of what we can learn about the universe at near and mid-infrared wavelengths, um, sometimes it's actually quite a similar phenomenon to what we discussed before with submillimeter. Uh, For example, the mid and near-infrared are a really powerful tool for studying hotter dust, like that found in protoplanetary or circumstellar disks, so those big disks of gas and dust that surround young stars shortly after they finished forming, um, before they started to form stars. 
And when we talked about the um, disc around A.B. Origi earlier on in the news, those images from the VLT, they were in the near infrared. In our own solar system, near and mid infrared light allows us to study Jupiter's otherwise invisible dusty ring. So don't know if you knew about that, but yeah, Jupiter's got one. It's just not as spectacular as Saturn's. Saturn's is made of ice. Jupiter's is made of dust. But Saturn also has a massive dusty outer ring, which is 200 times wider than Saturn is. So yeah, it's very, very, very far out compared to the, the rings that we're familiar with seeing. And these shores at infrared wavelengths are perfect for studying star formation regions. So where you've got all these hot young stars that are heating up dust to higher temperatures, like in the Orion molecular complex. But the key difference with near infrared is that you can get much higher resolutions at these, you know, shorter wavelengths. And so you can see much more detail than you could uh, in the far infrared or in the submillimeter. The near infrared is the perfect wavelength range to hunt for exoplanets, um, particularly for the transit method and the direct imaging method. So in the transit method, an exoplanet is found by watching a star and waiting for three successive similar dips in its light output. And this happens as the planet crosses in front of its host star as seen from Earth, blocking out a portion of the star's light. And the direct imaging method is, well, what it says on the tin, really. We, you know, physically take a photo of an exoplanet orbiting its star, which is absolutely amazing that we have this technology to be able to do that. And when we do this, we usually try and block out the light from the central star so that the planet isn't kind of lost in that glare from the star. The high temperatures of stars mean that they typically radiate most of their light at visible wavelengths. But because the planets are so much cooler, they will emit most of their light at infrared wavelengths. And so by observing in the infrared, the star appears dimmer, but the planet appears brighter. And this really helps enormously for the direct imaging method, but also for the transit method, because the absence of light caused by the transiting planet is a lot more obvious in the infrared. Um, and at these infrared wavelengths, a planet might only be a million times fainter than its host star compared to a billion times fainter at optical wavelengths. So it really does make a difference. The near and mid infrared is really useful for compositional analysis. So figuring out what things are made of, because there are a lot of spectral lines and different atoms and molecules in this window. And it's particularly useful for exoplanet atmospheres, figuring out what the atmosphere is actually made of. What I think is the most interesting though about the near and mid infrared is that these wavelengths allow us to discover and study the distant universe in exquisite detail because of a phenomenon called redshift. Now the universe is expanding. You know it, I know it, but thankfully we can't feel it. But what it does mean is that as the light travels through the universe, it essentially gets stretched and its wavelength increases, which causes the light to get redder, hence the redshift. By peering deeply at the universe at these redder wavelengths, so in the, in the you know, near infrared, mid infrared, we can actually see light from the earliest galaxies, light that was once bright blue from hot young stars, but has since been redshifted out of sight. So there you have it. The near and mid infrared is great for studying hot dust, big old lumps of dust, otherwise known as planets, and the place where all the dust is, otherwise known as galaxies. So, really, it is always dust. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it is question time, and hopefully we'll actually answer the question here instead of avoiding it. Um, <laughs> Have we been accused of that? This... Is that something we do? No. No, no, no. That's what politicians I do. I see. That was a not... thinly veiled jab yeah. at the powers that be. Now, the question for this month, um, a few people actually have asked us about it. Um, so I think maybe it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment. It's something that's being discussed sort of on the um, underground astronomy circuit. And it's our good friend Dave um, from Australia. He writes, I'm so excited by the news of the 2020 rover to Mars. I'm sure it will be awesome for so many reasons. But on the search for life front, from what I've read on the NASA website, we may be a little underwhelmed. The tools and experiments planned for the mission that I'm aware of do not seem up to the task of actual life discovery. I am obsessed with the possibility of life in the universe and impatient for some hard scientific data on the subject. Pull your finger out, NASA. 
before ESA or the Chinese space program steals your thunder. So Dave's question is, is there life on Mars? I mean, besides you two. Mm. <laughs> oh. Mm. So do we let the cat out of the bag here or do we still keep mum like we always have done? <laughs> I reckon, from an earthling point of view, yes, but I have a sneaking suspicion it might be life that has been transported from Earth to Mars on not properly decontaminated rovers. Oh, no. Uh, mm. I'm... I, I I flip backwards and forwards um, and I, I can never quite decide whether there is or there isn't um, and I think I fall down mostly on I don't think there will be life on Mars mm. why is that? I just think it's far too harsh an environment now I know that there is life that can flourish but I think it's just asking too much I think it's yeah. it's you look at the deserts of Earth and they are the places with the least amount of life. And essentially That's true. essentially Mars is a massive, very, very cold, low pressure desert. Mm. And so from an Earth perspective, it's this the place you're least likely to find life. And I just can't see it. I just I I, I think we will I mean, I think it'll take getting people up there. At which point we can, well, we'll never be able to say whether it's Martian life or. Well, you will be able to because you'll be able to be able to compare it. I was going to say, unless you know, it has very, very different DNA mm. or whatever. Mm. Um, but I think you know, w- once you start putting humans over there, that's it. It's completely contaminated, and you know, anything that you find sort of twenty down- years down the line, even you know, you'll say, yeah, oh look at that, it's got the same DNA structure as stuff on Earth. How amazing is that? And it's like, yeah, but probably came from here. But um, anyway, I reckon we'll find that there was life on Mars for a longer time than we anticipate. I, yeah, I just say, I think, I think my caveat is, I think we might discover eventually that there was life on Mars. Yeah. Um, I could full on believe in Martian fossils and stuff. Yeah. But I think any life that we find will be sort of, yeah, bacteria from the Earth that has, you know, been clinging on. Yeah, possibly. Though I... Other than maybe, maybe in like deep in the ice, we'll find some bacteria up on the caps. Maybe like, do you remember when they um they dug that really really deep ice core? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In in Antarctica or the Arctic, I can't remember which one. In it was. Antarctica, down to the lake, the yeah, the Russians went down to that lake. Yeah, yeah, and they and they found life down there. You know, hadn't been exposed for millions of mm, years, right? Mm. So maybe something like that. But again, finding that life is going to take getting people on Mars, I think. Yeah, uh, possibly. Um, I, I, I don't see it. I think, I think it's probably a dead world. I think it's just, it's just a bit of hope um, because it's got a bit of an atmosphere yeah. and there's some water there and things like that. I think it's, it's, it's hope over the kind of reality. I think it, it, it's really, I think, unlikely given the massively harsh conditions that life, even if there was life on Mars, that it survived this long and clung on mm. uh, without any kind of favourable conditions to kind of keep it going and, and drive any kind of evolution things. I can't see it. I can't see it. What What's it feeding on? What's, how's it, you know, it's, I can't see it. Can't see it. Yeah. Ralph, what do you reckon? I've, I've got a kind of few thoughts on this. So and uh, Mars was kind of really hospitable with pH neutral water for um, many hundreds of millions of years, which I think the modern thoughts on that is that it probably wasn't really long enough for, for life to, to really mm. get established on Mars or, or to become anything other than single-celled life, um, maybe bacteria. But the one thing I want to say is that don't be too disappointed that Perseverance or Mars 2020 rover is looking for evidence of previous life rather than that big jump to does life exist because I think there's more chance of finding evidence of previous life than finding life yeah. there now. Yeah. Like Paul says, you know, you land in an area. If you land in an area on Earth, there's a good chance you've got to plonk down in an area where there is no life. 
Um, and you know, Mars is a much more hardy place to even find life on. Mm. And if if we go back to say the Alan Hills meteorite in 1996, even though that turned out, you know, that was the one where under electron microscopy it looked like there was some bacteria on this chondrite rock um and it turned out no no it wasn't it was just a fissure uh, a, a formation within the rock but even despite that it was a huge sensation the fact that they thought that it was evidence for bacteria uh, fossilized yeah. bacteria on mars you know president clinton gave a press announcement about it mm. and you know it was it was just huge you know we've found life on mars so even if we do find some kind of evidence of previous life on Mars, that is going to be huge. And it's going to spur on that endeavor to get out to Mars as well so that oh, we can get more enormous. samples, so that we can do sample returns, um, so that we can do better analysis to find out whether it was panspermia, whether it was delivered from Earth, or whether it grew there natively in the environment. Um, mm. So if this finds evidence, and it doesn't do another Viking where, you know, it's, it's usually <laughs> contaminated. Yes, no, or maybe. If this finds evidence for, for previous life on Mars, that's when you're going to get your that's when you're going to get your real injection of cash into NASA for heading out to Mars. So, you know, good will come of this, even if it's mm. not that. You know, is life on Mars now? Because I, I doubt you'll find it now. No, mm -hmm. I can't see it. So I guess our summary is... We think probably in the past, but we're not going to find anything alive now other than stuff that's been transported from the Earth. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we'll leave it there then for this month. Drag ourselves back to reality. Um, as always... Do email, tweet us, anything you want us to discuss in the show. Um, we do kind of stockpile these. So if you don't hear it on the subsequent episodes, it doesn't mean we're not going to do it. We're just waiting for the opportune moment to bring it up. All of our episodes are now up on YouTube, thanks to Damien. And for most of our Between Episodes chatter, you can find us on at Awesome Astropod. Go forth in peace, spread the word, and in the name of the standard model, quantum mechanics and gravity, amen. So, until our space exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.